Hello, this is Let's Talk About Myths, baby, and I am your host, Liv. Oh, it's a time right now, isn't it? <clears throat> um, so I, I am here with you all. However, my COVID is just hanging around, disintegrating my brain. Uh, it feels like, and I, I really, really struggled creating and recording last week's episode in a way that was like honestly horrifying because I love this job and I love writing episodes and I love recording episodes. So when it is suddenly like a thing that will make me exhausted for the rest of the day and give me a headache, uh, it's incredibly depressing. In any case, uh, that is why I'm here with you all today with something a little special. Uh, so I reached out to my beloved friends in ancient history, fangirl, Jen and Jenny, and I said, hey, guys, have I done an episode with you that would fit really well on my feed so that I can take another week to recover from this monstrosity that is the plague? And they said yes. Thank the gods. And so today I am here playing you an episode that I recorded with Jen and Jenny a year ago, two years ago now. It is all about the emperor, the Roman emperor Hadrian and his obsession with Athens because he was obsessed with Athens and I am kind of obsessed with that whole idea. Anyone who has been to Athens, you will probably remember Hadrian's Arch, which is a major beautiful monument there, but you will also probably have seen what appears as the the name Adrian throughout the city. That's Hadrian. He is everywhere. And I had so much fun <laughs> just like spouting all of that to Jen and Jenny uh, for their show. So I, I am thrilled, honestly, to have this episode to share with you all now because I didn't share it back then. And gods, why the hell not? It is also a great reminder of how fun Ancient History Fangirl is. We've done lots of episodes together in the past and they are just a joy. So, you know, Head over and listen to them when you're done this if you are seeking more of that type of fun and ridiculous content. Now, it is also appropriate because I am working uh, behind the scenes on something that I have announced via my Instagram because honestly, that is just the best and easiest way to reach so many of you. Um, but I am working with a travel agency to plan a group trip to Greece. Um, the details are all available. Well, nothing is finalized yet, but what little I know of the details are available on Instagram. I'm going to pin that post if you want to go and take a look at it. Uh, but more information is to come. We'll be getting everyone's information who is interested. It's going to be a whole process, but I want to mention it here. Check out uh, my Instagram for more information, but also stay tuned. That said, as much as I will try to talk about it on the podcast as much as I can, it is going to be a time-sensitive thing coordinating this um, because we are going to be going in June. So things need to happen quickly. Uh, in order to have something that is not Instagram, though, what I will do is there will be a page on my website. Uh, let's say mythsbaby.com slash group trip. Uh, yeah, I haven't created it yet, but I'm going to in time for this to come out. And there will be a, a link in the episode's description as well. For the most part, that is not going to have any information um, quite yet, just until I confirm everything. But it is a place that you can periodically check uh, for updates when I have them if you are not on Instagram. But the easiest and best way to learn more about this will be just to follow along on my Instagram. And with all of that said, please sit back and enjoy my own obsession with the Roman Emperor's obsession with Athens. This is a special crossover episode with Ancient History Fangirl, 
Hadrian in Athens. This is the city of Hadrian, not Theseus. I'm Jenny Williamson. And I'm Jen McMenemy. And this is Ancient History Fangirl. So today we're joined by Liv Albert from Let's Talk About Myths Baby to discuss the Emperor Hadrian. And I'm so excited about this conversation. We have been talking about doing this for, it feels like months now. It does. And why why are we having Liv on? Because I very rudely told you you had to. Because Liv insisted is what happened. <laughs> I know. But I wanted to add that. Liv was like, so are you going to talk about Hadrian and all his building shit in Athens? And we're like, I don't know. And she's like, yes, you are. I'm coming on. Simply exactly how it happened. It's true. <laughs> we are doing this episode today because we just did a huge series on Hadrian's wall. And we talked a little bit about Hadrian and his life up until building the wall. He went up to... Britain to build the wall in 122 AD or, you know, commission the wall. Yeah, he didn't actually build it. There was no brick and mortar that he was laying. <laughs> absolutely, no, absolutely not. He did not lift a finger. Let's be very clear. And then we kind of let him go on his way and we stayed at the wall to tell that story. But we thought it'd be fun to bring a little bit more of Hadrian's life into this episode and maybe give him a little more context. And um, we knew just the lady to do that for us. Just the one to give you a very specific rundown on a very specific small part of his life and little more. <laughs> oh, that's totally fine because it's more than what we put in. So <laughs> so Liv, tell us a little bit about your podcast and your connection to Hadrian in Athens. Oh, right. The reason that I'm relevant and not just because I tell you guys you have to have me on to discuss certain things. Because <laughs> let's so, be clear, not everybody gets to do this with us. You have a privileged <laughs> position. <laughs> I do. Well, I am here because I am the host of the podcast, Let's Talk About Myths, baby. <laughs> that was sort of half sung. Yeah, so I am the host of that podcast, and I retell Greek myths. So the thing about Hadrian is that he was obsessed with Greece, which is why I am therefore interested in him. The thing that really caught my eye is the last time I was in Greece, sigh, heartbreak, almost three years ago now. I saw a whole exhibit on Hadrian set up in some of the areas that he built. And there's just so much to say about him and Athens. And so I am here. Yay! Well, we're so glad you're here. Yeah, we're so happy to have you back. You're always welcome here. And I am so glad to be here. Yeah, so um, we have discussed Hadrian at length. He was the emperor who commissioned Hadrian's Wall in 122 AD. Probably had a hand in designing it. Definitely did not lift a finger to actually fucking build it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but like I said, Hadrian's Wall was only a very small part of his life, and it's not the only massive building project that comes down to us today from his reign, and we are going to talk about his massive building projects in Athens today, which is really exciting. So, um, let's start with the basics. Hadrian was a very famous Philhellene. Um, would you describe yourself as a Philhellene, Liv? Oh my god, yes. Absolutely. Or a Hellenophile. There's two words. <laughs> yes, a Hel Hellenophile, yes. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, the word Helen, Hellene, Hellenism refers to ancient Greece before the word Greece existed. So the entire Greek world were Hellenes. Uh, that was the Hellenic world. The word Greece did not exist. We just inexplicably use it to refer to them, even though they didn't know it. And so essentially what that means is just that you love Greece. It's like a bibliophile, except for Greece. Essentially, it's the fancy way of saying you love all things Greek. Wait, can we pause? Because that's actually something I did not know. So the ancient Greeks did not use the word Greek. Yes. Yeah, it, it was. they were Hellenes, Hellenic people. I don't know when the word Greece came about. I actually meant to Google that today because I was thinking about it, but... Basically, yeah, the word Greece was not a thing. It's why, like, if you read Homer, and granted, like, when you're reading Homer, we're talking 7, 800 BC, they're referred to mostly as Achaeans there, which is a region in Greece, but it kind of broadly referred to all of Greece. They don't use the word Hellenic much, I think, in the in the Odyssey, because they're more, it was even earlier than when they were using that word more broadly. But then, yeah, that's why you have, like, the Hellenistic period. Of course, that's quite late. But at the same time, basically, yeah, it was just to refer to 
the whole of what we consider to be the Greek world now was the Hellenic world. Interesting. I did not know that. Yeah. So that's basically what Hellenophile Philhellene means is somebody who loves all things Greek or all things Hellenic, as they would have said. Exactly. What did it mean that Hadrian was a Philhellene or a Hellenophile? Like, how, how did this show up in his life? So there's little things that I was able to find other than basically it's just one of those broadly known things. Like historians, when they talked about him, noted it. It's just sort of a well-known and important fact about Hadrian's entire existence. It's a big part of his personality. Exactly. It was like his whole thing. But it manifested itself a lot in his building projects, but also just generally his life. So one really interesting thing is before he was emperor, he actually went to Greece, just kind of, I think he just first visited it because he wanted to, but he ended up staying there and being elected as the eponymous archon, which basically meant that he was the ruler of Greece under Rome. I mean, he was the ruler of Greece, but Greece was under Roman, the Roman Empire at the time. But the word archon actually refers to leaders of Greece, like long before the Romans came along. They just continued to use that word, yeah, to describe it when it came to Roman Empire too. So I don't know that much about the Athenian democratic system. I know more about the Roman democratic system. Was this like, this was like an elected position? Yes. And the things I'm going to say now are based entirely in my general having taken in information over the years and not having actually looked into it recently. (laughs) That's my little preamble, but... (laughs) We welcome broad generalizations and completely spurious claims here on this podcast, so you're good. <laughs> yes. Perfect. Uh, so yeah, with all, with all of that said, essentially by this time, Athenian democracy was no longer. They were ruled by a democracy during sort of like the so-called height of Athens, but that was in like the third or fourth century BC. Basically, I think it essentially ended after the end of the Peloponnesian War, but I could be lying there because Athens fell in essence to Sparta. And so I this is again some guessing, but the democracy was definitely gone just like a hundred or so years later when Alexander the Great tore through everything and took over everything because... When he rolled into town. <laughs> yeah, he just like fucking shit up because by that time they were ruled by Macedon. And so it was very much like another kind of tyranny, as they would call it, which is just basically a kingship because the Greek word for king is tyrannos, which is another fun fact. They did not think well of kings and we get the word tyranny from just the idea of a king. Well, that's fascinating, too, because the Romans did not like kings. Oh, no, they did not. They did not like kings. No, and they got that from somewhere. And it's really interesting because we talked about possibly the origin of that and did not consider that the origin of that might, in fact, have been ancient Greece. Oh, yeah, definitely. Because the Greeks had kings before they had democracy and it really went badly. And then so democracy came and that's when it it sort of they very much turned on kings. And Alexander the Great didn't, I don't think he called himself a king. He was very much like a conqueror and like so many other things. But he wouldn't have wanted to use the word tyrannos. But yeah, that's all to say Greek democracy hadn't been around for quite some time and then they fell to the Romans and then like a hundred years, no, even like almost 200 years after, I think, is when Hadrian came to town. So we're talking like a long time since they've had democracy or like a long time since they've even, you know, been ruled by themselves and even longer since they've had democracy. So it's a very different world, but it seems like they kept archons. So archons would have been like the regional leader of the area. And I can't quite tell if he was just the archon for Athens or if by that time, it was some kind of broader Hellenic slash Greek region that he was the archon for. Regardless, he was elected the archon long before he was emperor. So he just ruled there for at least a year. The eponymous archon basically means that he lent his name to the year in which he held that office. Kind of like consuls in ancient Rome. They, they would do that. Perfect. Yeah. So yeah, it would be the same thing. It might, it might be. It sounds kind of similar. And there, it's hard to say, but um, during the empire, those were sometimes also maybe an elected position just to have like the you know trappings of democracy, even though there wasn't really democracy or they might have been appointed by the emperor. I don't know. I haven't looked into it. I'm talking off the top of my head. But I mean, that certainly sounds like what it would have been here too, because I'm sure the Greek people didn't like on a whim 
elect this random Roman. Like, I think they appreciated him, but I'm sure, you know, out of all of the people, if they actually had like a full regular democracy, that they didn't just randomly pick a Roman guy. Yeah, I kind of wonder about that because um, he would have, I'm not sure what year this would have been, but um, he would have. It was 112, I think. Okay, yeah. He would have been like, let's see, when did he become emperor? I think it was 117 AD. Jen, correct me if I'm wrong on that. I don't know why you'd ask me if I would know the difference of that. I'm like, how would I know? Sure, 117 sounds right. Also, 1917 sounds right. You take a pick. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm totally alone here. I'm just going to go out on a limb and say 117 AD without Googling it. But he would have been like, you know, not that far before he became emperor himself, which means he would have been pretty highly placed in Trajan's administration. Yeah, he he definitely was. He was like touring all around doing work for Trajan and putting out fires and doing all of that stuff when he when he took on this role. So he was definitely like a very high powered Roman. So yeah, I'm not sure like what level of, you know, true democracy it was. But regardless, he was he was elected as that and he was given like honorary Greek citizenship too. Wasn't Mark Antony given honorary citizenship as well? I don't know. Was he? He was definitely the new Dionysus. I feel like they did give him some kind of honorary citizenship because they liked him so much. Remember when he was like hanging out in Athens and getting all the client kings and I guess Archons to come in and like give him good shit so that he would give them favors? They must have made him like an honorary citizen. They probably did. I mean, it was all because they wanted to not be made completely broke and ruined by Mark Antony and roped into his Parthian war. And the problem is they didn't understand Mark Antony. In order to like be a friend to Mark Antony, you got to bankroll his lifestyle. Which is why I'm just like, I bet there was some kind of quid pro quo going on. Yeah, definitely. I think from what I've read, I think there's like a a comfortable in between. And I don't know about this necessarily like before he was emperor, but of the Greeks like respecting him for what he was. Because I mean, as much as he was a Roman and therefore, you know, not native to their land and ruling them, he also gave them special treatment in every way humanly possible. So I think they were already ruled by Rome. Yeah, they were his favorites. They were his favorite by so much. And so they were already ruled by Rome for like a couple of hundred years. So I would think by that point, they're just going to be enjoying the fact that he loves them obsessively. And the thing is, too, like he loved ancient Greece, but particularly he just really like lionized everything about their ancient culture, not necessarily them now, kind of in the way we almost do today. He was all obsessed with the philosophers and so was very much a philosopher himself because he had sort of taken it on from the Greeks. I mean, basically sort of imitating it in every way, in every style of his life from his obsession with their history, philosophers, architecture. It was like a historical obsession. So it would be like someone being, you know, obsessed with the US, but being like the founding fathers and thinking it was still like that, right? If you think about it, like, I mean... The philosophers that we know of mostly now, you know, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, they were at least in the realm of what's math, almost 600 years, five to 600 years before Hadrian. Yeah, so it's like it's like us loving Shakespeare. He feels like an awful long time ago. When you think about it now, it's hard to separate that because to us, it's sort of, well, ancient Greece and ancient Rome must have been contemporaries, like unless you're in it like we are, obviously. But I think to a normal person learning about this stuff, you think of ancient Greece and Rome as they're so far back, so they must have been contemporary with each other. Whereas to them, yeah, there was like 500 years in between. So he's thinking back to these people that were to him ancient as well and revering them. That's so interesting. It, it, it would be like, I guess, being really into, I don't know, English culture, but associating it with Elizabethan England and Shakespeare. Yeah, exactly. Like it's a similar time period. It's a similar gap between it. It's a good way of looking at it in terms of the amount of time that has passed as much as we don't necessarily see it unless you really drill down into it that way. Well, if you think about it, there's a lot of people who are massive Tudor files, and that's exactly what they are. They are obsessed with Henry VIII and Elizabeth I in that time period, and obviously Shakespeare's in there as well, because it's far enough removed that it feels like a long time ago, but it's not so long ago that it was like in the ancient times. Like, I wonder how much he thought of that time as being what his contemporary Greece was like now to him. Well, what he did was try to make contemporary Greece as much like ancient Greece as he personally could as emperor, which we are going to get into. Oh, I'm so excited.
So basically what he was doing was rolling into London and being like, right, I'm going to remake this like Shakespeare's London. Yeah, essentially. He's like, I'm just going to completely renovate the Globe Theater. We're going to make it perfect again. And then everyone in London, me included, was like, are you aware of what happened then? Like, we don't really want any plague or rats with fleas or urine going out the window. <laughs> like, we don't want the whole South Bank to just be like, you know, dwelling in crime and bear baiting. They had bear baiting, remember? I mean, he also gave them an aqueduct, Jen. Aqueducts, Jen. Can we focus <laughs> on the aqueducts? Hadrian gave them an aqueduct, so he made it better for them. I mean, I do love an aqueduct. <laughs> So let's let's set the scene a little bit. Hadrian was first um, elected as archon before he became emperor. But when he became emperor, what was the context for him coming to Athens then? I wasn't able to, let's be honest, super easily find out why he traveled there other than I think he could because he was emperor and he wanted to. I mean, he was emperor. Greece was not that far. And he loved it. So I'm sure he just went there as much as he could. So he went there three times when he was emperor. Like, it looks like he went there between 124 and 125, 128 and 129, and 131 and 132. Basically, every, like, three or four years, he had to go and just, like, get his fix of ancient Greece. Two years this summer. Yeah, I I mean, it's been almost three years and I might explode soon. When Hadrian was emperor, what was the relationship between Athens and Rome? Athens was ruled by Rome. They were under the Roman Empire. I couldn't figure out if they were uh, an official province or what, but they weren't free. They'd fall into Rome in, oh, there was a, I think the battle was Corinth, which is obviously in Greece. But regardless, they'd fall into Rome like a couple hundred years before. Hadrian was basically visiting one of his provinces or one of his territories, I guess you could say. Yeah. I've got a question. Did Hadrian have like a favorite god that he associated himself with, like Mark Antony and Dionysus? Jen, we'll get there. Spoilers. Oh, sorry. 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 <laughs> I should have known you would have covered that. <laughs> Everything links back to his architecture. All right. Paint me a word picture of architecture. <laughs> yeah. Let's imagine Hadrian rolling into London and being like, I'm going to remake London like Elizabethan Shakespearean London, except it's in Athens. So what did he do? <laughs> Oh my god, he did so much. So the one thing I have referenced here before we even get to Athens, and I haven't looked into it deeply, I just so much remember it from my actual degree so long ago, but Hadrian's villa was very much inspired by his love of Greece. It's got a lot of Greek styles in that. It's also very Roman, but, and there's a lot of Antinous. I think it's in Rome or in like the um, suburbs, basically. Yeah, but it's like... My number one place to visit in my life. I want to see it so bad. Is it still there? Can we still go see it? There's a lot of it. Yeah, there's a lot of it still there. Oh, cool. Wow. All right. So Hadrian rolls into London slash Athens, and he's remaking it in his the image of whatever he wants it to be. Does he ever? Essentially, he rolled in and before, or not necessarily before, but perhaps simultaneously with all of his building projects that he wanted to remake Athens... He also apparently just like spoiled them rotten, like the favorite child completely. Pausanias wrote about Hadrian and Athens and basically just talked all about the level of generosity that he did. And then Cassius Dio also talked about his generosity with Athens. He says that he granted Athenians large sums of money, an annual dole of grain, and the whole of Kefalonia. Kefalonia is um, not far from where we were in Corfu. It's one of the islands over in the Ionian Sea. He gave them an island. So technically two islands, because the Kefalonian Islands, as far as I understand it, is Kefalonia and Ithaca. I don't totally know how that works, because like, is he giving them to Athens? They're already Greek or Hellenic or I don't. So that kind of weird to me. But basically, it's just question mark about what that really meant in terms of him bribing or not bribing, but being generous to the Athenians. I think it probably depends on the on the time period. It might have been like they were Roman territories and he he gifted them back. Yeah, but at the same time, Athens was still Roman territory. Sure, but he was returning like Ithaca, the homeland of Odysseus and Kefalonia, famous, beautiful Kefalonia to the Athenians because he loved them so much. I have a question. If I was a normal person just living in Athens at the time, would I be getting a check from Hadrian? That's a good question. I mean, I can't say for sure, but I think what you would have been getting is basically your city looking really good and looking really rich and generally being a lot richer and fancier and prettier than it was under previous Roman emperors. Like he builds like a whole new quarter in the city. Is it called the Hadrian Quarter? Did he like put his name on it like the wall? 
Well, he put his name on a lot of things individually, um, but not everything. But also, and this is based on my knowledge of Athens, less so than actually like what they constitute as quarters of Athens or whatever. But there's a couple different regions. Like he really focused in this one region near the Acropolis and then another region separately, which I'll get into what he built in either place. But in terms of modern Athens, they're quite separated. I'm not going to lie. I get really excited when I find out a Roman emperor put their names on things. Commodus literally put his name on so many things. Like Commodus, Commodia, Commodidium. Like it was crazy. Hadrian was also, he when he was emperor, he returned to Greece after, you know, being archon there and whatever. So I think this is his what is definitely his first visit to Athens as emperor. And he got initiated into the Eleusinian Mysteries, which I imagine was a pretty big deal because, like, there are a reason there's still mysteries today. We don't really know much about the Eleusinian Mysteries at all, other than, like, where they worshipped and who they worshipped. But they were, like, a major mystery cult, like, the mystery cult of ancient Greece. So he was initiated into the Eleusinian Mysteries. And then, so in March of the next year, he got to preside over the Agonothetes, which seems to mean that he was the superintendent. This is a, this is a quote, I should say. He was a superintendent of the sacred games at the Great Dionysia. Oh, the drunken <laughs> wine games where they, like, danced on the wineskins! Slash just carry enormous wooden penises on poles through the city. We talked about it in our Dionysus episode. Was this associated with the theatrical stuff? Yeah. So this greater Dionysia was the uh, festival in the city of Athens every year. There's the greater and the lesser. The lesser was in the country and then the greater Dionysia was in Athens. It was essentially, I mean, it was like the festival of Dionysus. I think it lasted like at least three days, if not longer. So much went on. There was lots of sacrifice and fanfare, lots of wine, obviously. And then there were the plays. Yes, the plays were the big thing. Exactly. The height of the Greater Dionysia would have been, you know, Euripides putting on his plays and Sophocles and Aeschylus and competing, right? So there would be three plays and then they would win for a second, third. It's a whole thing. Well, there was the tragedies and the comedies. Yeah, I'm not big on when they came into comedies. I don't even remember. But each got to put on three plays and they had satyr plays. Which is maybe what you mean. So the satyr plays were like a really bawdy comedy. I mean, as we know from stories of satyrs when we talk about Dionysus, there would always be someone on stage with a giant erection, like a dong so big that you couldn't miss it. Look, if there's not somebody with a giant erection on the stage, is it even theater? <laughs> is it even the greater Dionysia? I mean, I would say Euripides rarely put enormous dongs on the stage. <laughs> So the Greater Dionysia is like a huge example of him being sort of welcomed into that Athenian world. I mean, it was one of the most important things that it was like, I think the second most important festival, the first being the Panathenaic festival that was for Athena. So it was just a huge example of of him being very important to them. And it even, so this is all from the following Hadrian website slash the book, but she says that it's possible there were 12 statues of Hadrian set up in the theater of Dionysus by the 12 tribes of Athens, like one statue per tribe, which essentially, I mean, it's like another example of him being like very welcome by Athens. So he, it's basically like him rolling into London and remaking the Globe Theater and the people of London creating all these different statues of him and putting them in the theater. Yeah. And we haven't even gotten to him remaking it yet. That's just like him presiding over the festival so i'm not sure when exactly he actually remade the theater or because he remade the theater fully like we're not it's not even like a it's not even just like a funny example to use globe theater like he literally remade the theater of dionysus completely so it was built in the sixth century it's the oldest greek theater which is super cool it was like changed and expanded over time but when sulla invaded greece and basically took greece for rome he's just a bag of worms he's the worst giant bag of worms yeah yeah, he really fucked up that theater. He really wrecked it. And so essentially Nero, it seems, started restoring it, but Hadrian came in and fully restored it. And he created all of these um, friezes. So they're called like the Hadrianic friezes that are still available today. I think they're probably in the museum versus still left in, in situ because they wouldn't be. But there's all these extensive friezes that he had carved to show the gods and the festival itself and everything for the theater so he did like a huge huge building project 
fixing this theater that was so important to them and so important to Greek history. Like, it's the first theater. It's the birthplace of Western classical theater as as we know it. Yeah, definitely. And essentially in doing this is an answer to your earlier question, Jen, is what God he connected himself with. Because just like Mark Antony, it was Dionysus. No, 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 Hadrian. You don't get to have Dionysus. I am not okay with this. Hadrian deserves Dionysus more than Mark Antony deserves Dionysus. Oh. Oh, no, no. I will fight you on this. Mark Antony might have been Dionysus come back again. <laughs> I'm going to sit back and eat my popcorn and watch this throw down. <laughs> State your cases, ladies. Show your work. <laughs> hey, so I think, I think these are the two sides of Dionysus. The complete drunken madness side that's mark antony and then the like sophisticated theater side and that's hadrian yeah but i also feel like mark antony was a drunken war elephant but he was also a revered general who had quite a few successful campaigns none of which are appropriate to dionysus jen well except when dionysus returned with his band of war elephants and amazons and came back to did he build a full theater okay no Look, here's the thing. Dionysus didn't build any theaters. People built them for him. (laughs) Mark Antony didn't have to build a theater. He just rolled up and they were like, you are the new Dionysus. And he did. Did Mark Antony perform in any plays? Oh my goodness, did Mark Antony perform in plays? I'm sure he did. (laughs) I love everything about this conversation now so hard. (laughs) Mark Antony literally like had a fortune and squandered it by the time he was like his majority by the time he was an adult and because he was so dedicated to his new Dionysus role he had a chariot like a little like small chariot or whatever that was like pulled by like leopards or lions or something just like Dionysus did lions they were lions okay all right all right I concede with that one that's your detail that gets me Dionysus his animal was not the lion it was the leopard or a bull or or a sneak. Look, okay, Mark Antony, if he got drunk enough, anything would work. Yeah, he had a chariot pulled by snakes. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, that's so- Let's delve more into the Hadrian argument for Dionysus though, because I'm I'm interested in hearing that side of the story. I haven't prepared one. <laughs> Okay. Give us some very spurious speculations. <laughs> I mean, I think certainly in my mind, it's more about what he did for Athens that he got that, you know, less so about necessarily his personality. Like he rebuilt their whole theater and that's just the first architecture building project that I am mentioning. It, the list goes on and on and on. When it comes to Hadrian sort of being connected with Dionysus and being called sort of the new Dionysus. It was the idea of he was a new Dionysus and like the new founder of Athens, according to this one source I've been reading. So, but I think in in at least focusing on the theater being such an important part of, of Athenian history and culture, that kind of warrants something. But regardless, it seems like, I don't know if he did it himself or if the Athenians did it. I mean, they seem to have built these statues to him at least. But regardless, Dionysus seems to be the god. I don't know if it was something he did, he connected himself with beyond the theater itself and then the greater Dionysia, but that's the reference I have. He wasn't actually trying to embody Dionysus. He was trying to serve him. Yeah, that's what it seems like. I can also see that in, okay, one of Dionysus's other sides is like he was an agricultural deity. He was a sacrificial king who brought about wealth and prosperity when he came back around. I could see like probably after a period of being heavily taxed and maybe not having the best time from Rome, you've all of a sudden got Hadrian swooping in and giving the people grain and helping them out more. I can see that correlation. I will give you that. In later times, Dionysus becomes a little bit connected with the Lucinian mysteries. Depending on where you are in the cycle sometimes Dionysus is like a sacrificial king involved in some of the worship so that might have been some of it too this seems mostly connected to the theater but I definitely see that in in the harvest kind of yeah getting gifted with with things in Athens because essentially there's a point in time where Dionysus pushes out Persephone in her own mysteries sorry there's no rage there (laughs) so when you go to visit the theater today how much of it is Hadrian's theater so there's not much of it left today It's pretty, I mean, it's like most of the ancient theaters that I personally have seen. I can't believe I get to say that phrase because I think I've seen at least three. But it's, you know, you you can see the steps, you can see the floor in the center. But I think a lot of the rest is, I don't know if it's in the Acropolis Museum 
having been there, I don't think the Hadrianic reliefs are still in situ. I think they're somewhere else. Like in a museum somewhere. That's probably for the safest, to be honest, because there's a lot of earthquakes in that area. Well, it's more also modern times. You have to walk really close to it when you're walking up the Acropolis. Like there's two ways to come at the Acropolis, but you do get to walk through. They have an outdoor setup. I should look through my pictures and see if I have any pictures of the Hadrianic reliefs, actually. But they have this outdoor setup if you come through this one side entrance to the Acropolis. And essentially there's full coverings, but they're otherwise open air. And there's a lot of different fragments and just marble pieces that were found around the theater. So there's like some that's, you know, tell you who had plays performed or actors names and things like that. So that might be where some of them are as well. So it was made a lot bigger in Hadrian's time, the theater. It wasn't made bigger. It was just made fancier and fixed from Sulla's wreckage. Sulla died in the 80s. BC. So I'm not sure when he came to Athens, but it, this is like at least 50 years prior. And it's BC, so not 50 years, like 100, 200 years, almost 150 years. I, I didn't get the switch. I was like thinking AD and yeah, never mind. Um, But yeah, so it was like several centuries is what we're talking that the theater in Athens was basically like a hulking ruin. I'm not totally sure what it was. I think it would be hard to like fully destroy it. But it definitely didn't look good. Yeah. And this is like their central, like a big part of their worship and identity as a city. So this is a big deal. Hadrian coming in and fixing that up. Yeah, exactly. So there's these 12 tribes of Athens and each one had a statue of Hadrian. And then they added a 13th tribe. Yeah. So yeah, there was that note in the same source that I've been using. So it seems like a 13th tribe that they called Hadrianus was added. So I don't know the details of that or or what the ramifications were or whether it was just kind of for show. But I think what they were probably doing is thinking like, hey, this guy loves us. He's the emperor now. Like if we honor him in this way, he's going to keep having us as his favorite and it's just only going to mean good things for Athens under Rome if we are the favorite. What other things did Hadrian build in Athens? So the list. The Theater of Dionysus was a huge part of what he redid in Athens, sort of what he fixed up. One of the other major things that he completed is the Temple of Olympian Zeus or the Olympion. That one's really interesting because it was actually started and stopped a number of times. He did finish the Temple of Olympian Zeus or the Olympion. So he is kind of credited as being its creator, even though he technically just finished it. But he did enough that it's definitely still his. Near the Olympion, he built a bath complex that was very much him bringing Rome to Greece, obviously. So he he commissioned a, a large Roman bath complex with mosaic marble floors and... This is a quote, colored marble slabs, marble on the walls. There was a nymphium nearby, so a temple to the nymphs, but that had like a little fountain. There were waiting rooms, changing rooms. It was very luxurious bath complex, which is probably normal in Rome, but was very much not, not normal in Greece. And so he created this sort of really luxurious thing for the Greek people. Would this be open to the public? Uh, I imagine to the the right level of public, yeah. <laughs> Not women or like non-citizens, but to like Greek men, sure, I would imagine so. We want to keep the riffraff out. So like everybody but, you know, wealthy male citizens, right. <laughs> yeah, ex- exactly. Listen, we want to we want to keep the riffraff out. We want to keep Jenny Williamson and me out. We are never invited. I am never invited. I'm with you. We're not allowed in the baths. We were so not allowed in those baths. I don't know that I want to be in those baths, to be honest with you. So that's all. That was also near the Olympion, and so basically he created that whole structure. He finished the Olympion itself, which is that temple of Zeus, and then he created this bath complex nearby. And then Pausanias said he had another. He created another a temple of Cronus and Rhea. And a sacred ground to Gaia, all in the same kind of area. So these are things that I think, I don't know if we have much more evidence other than Pausanias, but we have Pausanias talking about it. Supposedly there was a gymnasium with a hundred columns of Libyan marble right from Tunisia. And and then a temple of Hera, Penhelenia, and Zeus Penhelenios. That basically means like all of the Hellenic world. So Hera of all of Greece and Zeus of all of Greece. A lot of gods were localized, right? So what does it mean to to have um, Zeus and Hera Penhelenia? It seems to me it's another way of kissing the butt of the Greeks. 
Aha. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. And I, I mean, I don't know that, but given we don't actually necessarily know much more about them other than, yes, he might have had those built. There's no physical archaeological evidence that there were those temples. But based on those names, it seems to me it's sort of a, a way to connect the rest of the Greek world to those temples and Athens and then therefore Hadrian. It's making Athens like a real, like reaffirming it as a center of religion and reaffirming Hadrian as the giver of that center of religion. Definitely, yeah. I don't know if this is something that would have happened in the rest of Rome. It seems to me it wouldn't have, or the Roman Empire rather. But all of these temples are named for the Greek gods very specifically. So I don't know if the Romans would have come in and put in a temple to Juno in Athens. That seems really presumptuous. But, you know, these are like Kronos, Rhea, Hera, Zeus. Like these are all gods that the Romans have equivalents. But these are very much the Greek gods. Almost like your gods are better than the Roman gods. Or I know the Romans just borrowed most of your gods. Almost even like your gods are my gods. And the rest of the Romans can have the Roman gods. Yeah. did Hadrian library of Hadrian tell us about that (laughs) I just saw that in the notes (laughs) I will yes so one of his more impressive building projects was the library of Hadrian there's parts of it that remain I think mostly just walls but it seems to me that it's a little bit of both in terms of the architectural style so a little Roman a little Greek but a lot of what he did have built in Athens was more of the Roman style you can usually tell because there's like certain columns and temple structures in Athens that have um smooth marble versus the flutes and those are usually ones that were built by rome if not exclusively built by rome as romans liked them smooth i love a good flute though we like the fluted marble we approve of the fluted marble love a good flute i just remember in latin class god it must have been like in seventh grade it was like dumb doric for like the boring doric columns and then it was something with ionic i prefer flutes and ionic order capitals That's just my goals. I've always been a fan of the Corinthian. I find those a little flashy. There was one for Corinthian too, but I always remember dumb dork and I always felt bad for dork. But it just meant they were the plain ones. The Parthenon is Doric. Sometimes you just have to keep it really opulently minimalist. That's what Julius Caesar would say, but... And the defining feature of opulent minimalism is exactly six busts of Julius Caesar. (laughs) (laughs) In your living space. That's what's in your tiny home. (laughs) So, um, Library of Hadrian. Yes. So the Library of Hadrian was an enormous structure that was part traditional library, but then also was used in so many other different ways. But there were there was a lot of scrolls stored there. So it was explicitly a library as well. But it was used for a lot. And I think another reason for him to put his name on something, because it was also right by the Roman Agora that he he didn't build it, but he made it a lot fancier. And he built the library near it. So the Roman Agora was already there since they had been ruled by Rome for a while. But when he was building the library, he had the whole area paved with marble. So it was just made so much fancier. I mean, he basically just made everything prettier if he didn't build stuff brand new. Look, Hadrian liked to blink things out. What is an agora? Like the city hub where everything kind of happened. It was a market. It was a meeting place. Major city center kind of hub. The Athenian agora is right at the bottom of the hill of the Acropolis. So it's like right next to the Acropolis. And that's where they had like, I'm now I'm going to forget the word for it, but it was like where their courthouse was next to the agora. And then the agora was that sitter center too. So it was sort of everything was right below the Acropolis when it comes to the Athenian. And then sort of just down the way, the Romans built the Roman agora. So I don't really know if like that meant that the Athenian agora wasn't used as much or if that there were just two and the Romans built their own or what have you. But it was like a whole sort of separate section. It's quite close by. If you go to Athens, you can get a pass for like 30 euro where you get to see like five sites. So it's like the Roman Agora and the Acropolis and the Athenian Agora and the Olympion. Would the Athenian Agora be where all the famous philosophers would have congregated way back when? 
Yeah, definitely. Like, it was where kind of everything happened. Like, the courthouse where Socrates was imprisoned is there. It's where they had their all their political happenings. I don't know if it was necessarily explicitly in the Agora or next to the Agora because the Agora was the central place, the hub. So I don't know what where the line of what constitutes technically the Agora stems, but essentially that was all in that general area. So tell us about the aqueduct. So he Hadrian commissioned an aqueduct in Athens. He didn't finish it. It was finished under Antoninus Pius, but it was used until the 20th century, I learned today. That's insane wow that is fascinating this is gonna sound stupid i know what an aqueduct is i just i don't really understand how they work i just i I know exactly what it is and how they like i just don't like to me it just feels like it's magic it's plumbing it's full-on plumbing it's like a giant river supported by arches and beautiful arches it's like a river castle it's a whole giant archy River castle. A river castle. There are still cities where you can see a fully formed aqueduct. I was in one in Spain that's like, it's like really dramatic. It cuts right through the city center and it's giant. It just dominates the whole city. It's incredible. Well, the interesting thing about this one too, and I don't know if it was sort of like newer technology or what, but it didn't also just bring water to Athens, but it also carried it away. So it just kind of served as everything. And then, yeah, like they were, it was in use until the 20th century, which blew my whole mind apart. That's incredible. So do you know anything about what the um, water sanitation situation in Athens would have been prior to this aqueduct? Like, would this have been like a real material change in the quality of living over there in the sanitation? The Greeks definitely had their own form, but it wasn't as sophisticated. And this is again, this is a lot of me like guessing based on what I know, but I know they weren't like completely in the dark, especially by this point, because it's it's really late. And the Athenians and the Greeks in general were very innovative in their building and architecture and everything. So I'm sure they had something, but it definitely would have been would have been an important change, I would think. That's incredible. Like, and this is just so interesting to me is just like how important water flow and sanitation would have been to like the health of a city. Well, Athens had it was famous for a plague. I mean, this was again, long, long, long before. But yeah, I mean, so what's your favorite of Hadrian's building projects? So my favorite is the Olympion and then that'll lead directly into the Arch of Hadrian, which is also incredible because they're next to each other. So The Olympion slash the Temple of Zeus, there's just two different names for the same thing. It was finished by Hadrian. It was not started by Hadrian. It was sort of like ongoing for hundreds of years, actually, and just sort of sat there unfinished. But apparently, mythologically speaking, they believed that an original building was built by Deucalion after he survived the flood. Who's that? So Deucalion is the Greek flood myth. So Noah and the Ark is Deucalion and Pyrrha. It was the one couple that survived the deluge, the great flood, since so many of those ancient cultures in that area had a flood myth. Deucalion and Pyrrha was the flood myth of the ancient Greeks. So essentially, that makes Deucalion like one of the first people. Do you know, Liv, most cultures across the world have a flood myth. Yeah, I thought so too. Yeah, I I wanted to gen- not generalize completely, but I thought so. There are stories from indigenous peoples in the Americas. I, I believe there are stories from Eastern cultures as well. Gilgamesh. Yeah, almost every sort of ancient culture has a flood myth, which makes me wonder what was happening in the archaeology and like the, the Earth's history. And I think there have been different things that have been discovered, but I wouldn't want to like make a generalization until we get there. Yeah, or like if it happened, but way far back and it's like this really big cultural memory. I read something about that because I covered the myth of Deucalion and Pyrrha just like a month ago on the podcast. And I think it was, you don't have to quote me on this, but I think it was Adrian Mayer who wrote about how shells and things that were definitely from the ocean were found on mountains and like very high up. And so the ancient people then developed a myth about how that happened and it became yeah that's like the flood myths based around that because there definitely would have been some kind of deluge but whether or not people actually saw it happen or whether they found evidence and wrote about it is kind of the question right yeah like you know an aquatic looking dinosaur bone like a mosasaur like the pictish beast it all comes back to the pictish beast bringing it full circle exactly like the pictish beast Or the Loch Ness Monster. Now you're really starting stuff. Get a few drinks in Jen and ask her about the Loch Ness Monster slash the Pictish Beast and then sit back. Oh boy. (laughs) So the Temple of Olympian Zeus, it had actually been started in 6th century BC. 
And so actually, this comes back to what I was talking about earlier with the way Athens felt about tyrannies and kings, tyrannos, because they stopped building it when they stopped having kings, when democracy came. Aristotle apparently said that they stopped because under Athenian democracy, it felt like hubris to build a temple with that magnitude, which I think is fascinating because it's so much bigger than the Parthenon. I did a comparison. So the column height of the Temple of Olympian Zeus is 17 meters, or I translated it for you Americans, 55 feet and nine inches. Holy shit. That is enormous enormous and the parthenon is only 10.4 meters or 34 feet so we're talking like 21 feet taller than the parthenon so this would have dwarfed the parthenon yeah that's the thing it was monumental like just cyclopean is the word they'll often use though they actually believe the cyclops built it when they say that but i'm just gonna use it built by giants that's what that means yeah well exactly yeah but specifically the cyclops but (laughs) one specific giant but in general (laughs) well no there were more than one cyclops it's a brace of giants one specific kind of giant single ocular giants yes exactly (laughs) let's debate about cyclops (laughs) (laughs) that's what i was trying to say so It also like had many different versions of it. So it was originally going to be built in the Doric style with just like local limestone. And then once the Romans were ruling, they changed it to Pentelic marble, which is the marble quarry mountain that's nearest to Athens. That's what most of the Acropolis, but specifically the Parthenon is made out of. So they switched it to Pentelic marble. So they made it a lot fancier. And then they changed the columns to Corinthian order. So they made them fancier and they kind of brought them up with the time. Because if you're beginning this project in 6th century BC, you're going to use Doric. 6th century BC is before the Parthenon was built. I don't know necessarily if it was originally meant to be that tall or if that came with the Romans too. But either way, they saw it as too big for under democracy. So clearly it was bigger than the Parthenon because they built the Parthenon under democracy. And that was said by Aristotle. So, I mean, ultimately, who knows? So this had like been halted because it was not, it was seen as non-democratic. Exactly. So, but we're talking like 700 years of trying to build this thing. <laughs> wow. So like there there were these giant ruins in the city of Athens for like 700 years is what you're telling me. Wow. Oh, not there's even more before then because then when Sulla sacked Athens in 86, he actually stole parts of the columns that had already been built for however many years. I'm not sure when they, they were built throughout these 700 years of building this temple. He stole parts of the columns. He brought them back to Rome and he used them on the temple of Jupiter on Capitoline Hill. Oh, interesting. It's interesting how big of a part of the story Sulla is. I'm really interested in that. Yeah, he... Just as the the emperor or not emperor. As the dictator. He was the dictator. As as the asshole who sacked Athens and fucked up a bunch of their shit prior to Hadrian coming in. And Hadrian was like, hold my beer. I'm going to finish these ruins. Exactly. So Sulla like stole pieces from it. So essentially this temple over the course of 700-ish years really went through a lot of shit when they were just trying to build this temple, which I just found absolutely fascinating. So who knows what kind of iterations it went through and what all the actual reasonings were, you know. But ultimately, it seems like it was something that had been going on for so long. And then finally, Hadrian came in. He had his enormous building projects in Athens. He was building the Agora and he was building the library and he was fixing up the Temple of Dionysus and he was doing so much for the city. And so obviously, he would also finish this temple that they'd been starting and stopping for so many years. It just seems so appropriate. So they finished it under Hadrian, and then he really built up that whole area. That's where the bath complex was. Oh, and then there was a couple of those other temples that we don't have ev- we don't have archaeological evidence of necessarily, but Pausanias talked about them. So that whole kind of area was built up. It is quite far, actually, from the Roman Agora and the other things that he built. So that's kind of interesting in itself. It's a bit of a trek. You mean the baths or? Yeah, the- well, and the Olympion. So the Olympians near the baths and possibly this temple of to Kronos and Rhea and then the Agora and the library. Would these have been like, would these been have been, that was my question, like were these all within walking distance? Yeah, parts of them. The temple of Olympian Zeus is fascinating because it's like, I think there's five columns that are still standing and then there's one that's fully toppled so you can see all the pieces. It's 
beautiful. Yeah, the Temple of Olympian Zeus, what's left is is stunning. And then the Roman Forum, there's not a ton. The Hadrian's Library, there's a little bit more. So there's definitely a lot visible. And and that's now too. Like they've done a lot. They do a lot of excavations pretty constantly in Greece. I know they found a lot of things when they were building the subway for the Olympics. Um, and so, yeah, and it, often it's when they're building subways, they find more. So the uh, Temple of Olympian Zeus tied into uh, the Arch of Hadrian. Yes. So because Hadrian finished the Temple of Olympian Zeus, he sort of commemorated it all and built up that whole area with the baths and everything and made the whole area kind of fancy and incredible. And the so the Arch of Hadrian... It was built to honor Hadrian because of all the work he'd done in Athens. So it's not totally clear who built it, but it's possible that it was actually commissioned by the Athenian people themselves. But it was essentially to commemorate the finishing of this temple of Olympian Zeus, the Olympion, you know, this thing that was started 700 years ago and Hadrian finally finished. But the most fascinating thing about the arch, because the arch is still standing, it's a couple of different levels. It's a very cool, interesting little structure. But there are two inscriptions on the Arch of Hadrian. On one side, if you're looking at the arch, looking at the Temple of Olympian Zeus, it says, this is the city of Hadrian, not Theseus. Oh. And if you're standing, yep, yep, just wait. And if you're standing on the other side of it, facing the arch away, (laughs) away from the Olympion, you can basically see the Acropolis. And that, the, apparently the inscription on that side is actually debated the intention of the phrasing and the, the translation itself, but it essentially says, this is the ancient city of Theseus. What it is, is suggesting that Hadrian built so much of Athens up that he built the new Athens versus Theseus's old Athens. So the Acropolis and the old Agora and all of that was Theseus's Athens, And then Hadrian did so many building projects in Athens itself that he got to have his name on like so-called new Athens. How much did Hadrian transform the city? Like if you rolled into Athens 10 years after Hadrian had been there, it would have been like a different city, right? They would have had different landmarks. It seems like it. Yeah. Well, certainly would have different landmarks. Yes, that's definitely true. I'm not totally sure kind of what kind of shape it was in beforehand, you know, under Rome and post Alexander. My time frame of obsession is classical Greece. So this is so much later than where my love stems from. We have pinned you as a as a bona fide Philhellene. Hellenophile. Yes, classical Greece, Phil Helene. Let's think about how the ordinary Athenian would have thought about Hadrian's changes to their city. Because I have this idea in my head of this sort of city that had been just ravaged by various, you know, waves of colonization. You know, like Sulla had come in the 80s BC and he destroyed a bunch of things and there were all these ruins from that time. And then, of course, prior to that, there were the Spartans and the Macedons who were also Greek, but still they had come in and caused a lot of damage. So there was all this stuff, like, for example, the theater, which would have been a really big center of cultural identity that would have been just destroyed in the middle of the city. And then Hadrian would have come in and repaired it. But he was still a Roman colonizer. Like, what do you guys think about that? I kind of feel like he was a colonizer. And what Hadrian was repairing, he was repairing in the image of the knowledge and ideas that had come to Rome about what ancient Athens should look like. So everything that he repaired was going to look like what the Romans felt the ancient Athenians should have had, as opposed to like the Athenian idea. And that doesn't mean he didn't like talk to Athenians about what it would have looked like, but he was still the emperor at the time, or he was still a very high ranking Roman official at the time. And it would have been difficult with the imbalance of power for Athenians to sort of say anything against what his wishes were. What do you think, Liv? I I, I think good points all around, honestly, because I want to I want to believe that they appreciated what Hadrian did. But I want to it's also important, I think, to think of it the way Jen is, that they were colonized by the Romans. But I think it's one of those things that's sort of impossible to understand fully, because I think comparatively to the situation before and probably after Hadrian, he would have seemed like a breath of fresh air because he really revered them. He gave them what they wanted, what they needed. He built their city up. He made it beautiful again. To the average Athenian then, 
you know, classical Athens was 400 minimum years ago. So to them, they'd had whatever they'd had for so long, but they had that in their history of their great city of classical Athens. But at the same time, of course, like you guys are saying, like he is a colonizer. Rome has colonized Greece. So you have to remember that. I mean, I think it's just an impossible thing to say. And, and let's put the Bernie Sanders lens on this. He also gave them a grain dole and built a whole new quarter for them and built an aqueduct for, you know, improving the uh, sanitation in the city. So like maybe he also improved the lives of the common people in Athens. Yeah. And that grain dole is a huge thing. Like that grain dole essentially was Hadrian saying, you are a sister city with Rome. You were on the same level as the mother city. When Hadrian did all of his rebuilding in Athens, he was using the Greek gods names. He wasn't Romanizing them. You know, he was saying the temple of Olympian Zeus as opposed to the temple of Olympian Jupiter, which he could have done well and and what you were saying to jen about putting athens on an equal footing with rome hadrian made that pretty damn clear so in the greek agora so the original agora that was there long before him there is a headless statue of hadrian i've only learned these details i'm about to share this morning but i have pictures of this statue of hadrian from 2005 and then 2012 and then 2018 because it's a really stunning fragment and it's just sort of so pointedly in the middle of the agora so it was originally placed on a, a pedestal in front of the hadrianic nymphium and on his breastplate athena is standing on the back of the she-wolf that is suckling Remus and Romulus. That is so cool. That's like saying Athens over Rome. Yeah, it's like Athens standing on the back of Rome. And she's flanked by two Nikes, winged victories. And so she's also like victorious over Rome almost you know it's a really telling detail on that so it's he's depicting himself pointedly right like this is a statue of Hadrian but his armor is depicting the story of of Athena being Athens standing on the she-wolf and being victorious it kind of blew my whole mind thank you so much for coming on and telling us all about this Liv this has been amazing Oh, I mean, thank you so much for having me. For one, I'm always happy to talk to you guys. But also, I could talk about Greece forever. And as soon as you said you were talking about Hadrian at all, I was like, so have I told you about how much Hadrian was obsessed with Greece? Because can I? Yes. And I was just like, obviously you can. And let's make this an episode. Ugh, nerds. Thank you so much for listening. I was so glad to have that episode. I really, like, I'm so eager to get back into doing this as I always have been, um, but I'm also trying to be kind to myself because it's not going the way I want and I don't want to make it worse and make everything last longer. Thank you all so much for listening. Um, I'm not going to read the full credits right now because I'm just trying to... Ugh, exist but you know thank you to Michaela uh, Smith who handles all of my incredible everything uh, I'm working with with someone new right now Laura um, I'm not going to say more because I realize I need to get her permission um, I'm going to have new music coming on the show uh, more like what I had in that Thyestes episode once I am back to myself and I'll be reading more about that um, in the, the credits. Um, but for now, everything's the same. Um, the show is hosted and monetized by iHeartMedia. Uh, they're awesome. And, you know, um, <laughs> uh, listen wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you all. I really hope I am better next week. Phew. This is the worst. I really want my brain back to the job that I love so much so I can continue bringing you all the nerdiest nerd content there is. Thank you all. I am Liv and I love this shit. <laughs>